So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about something really interesting to me uh, in my career arc uh, that's led me to uh, the venture capital side of the world uh, and also to be always asking about the bigger questions about what design can do. Uh, and that is about designing science uh, itself. So uh, just a quick background. You heard um, yeah, an embarrassing little intro about me. But I, I, did, um, I did work for a decade at IDEO uh, where I learned kind of really deeply about the design process. And uh, I think one of the biggest things I found there was uh, you know, as designers, you design something and then you you know, give it to the client, and then the client would take it, and it comes out looking completely different. You're like, those guys suck. And uh, it's after a while, I actually learned that it's not that they sucked; it's that they have constraints that we didn't consider as designers. And so, one of the things that I always was thinking about doing was how do you find those other constraints? Um, and so that led me to understanding how do you design a business alongside designing the product. And of course, once you start doing that, you're one step away of actually doing a startup, which is what, we did, what I did next. Uh, we built my, I built with my wife a company called Starters, uh, which is a fitness app to help people just get started on their uh, road to fitness. Uh, and that was an amazing experience. And um, uh, it was really powerful to see how fast you could have an idea, execute it, Get it in the marketplace, and you know, within two months, 93 countries, people in 93 countries are using it, thousands of users, and getting emails of uh, from people saying, "Wow, that that actually helped me in my life," and that got me empowered to start thinking about uh, how else to scale design. Uh, so I left uh, IDEO to join a venture capital fund called SOSV, uh, where early stage investing I found to be extremely similar to being a designer, actually. Uh, you are working with small teams uh, that don't have to take your opinion. Um, they are working on hard problems uh, that are building products and businesses against uh, a timetable, which is the burn rate. So that was a natural fit for me, and I had a, had a great time. And the question was, what's the focus? Uh, I have a background in genetic engineering as well, and so I found that the time was right, actually, uh, for, for trying something around science. Um, and so I'm here partially to talk to you. Uh, this is I'm going to have to go really fast, um, uh, so pl please bear with me. But I'm here partially to talk to you tonight about um, humanity's looming crisis, right? Which is um, this graph is actually the world population over time from two million years ago, right? So Neanderthals and uh, Homo sapiens all the way to about 200 years ago. There's this massive population explosion. We go from about a billion people to seven billion people in a couple hundred years, right? Which, you know, the, the, when you put it in context, um, it's, a, it's a literal explosion. Um, when you extrapolate out, that's an, we'll double that again in another two generations, right? So, so that, that brings up a really big point, which is how are you going to deal with double the number of, pe number of people on the planet? and the same amount of resources. So we're already seeing, I, don't, I mean, we all, I think, are seeing a, a drifting gap, a growing gap, between the rich and poor. And uh, I think it's going to be really hard um, to understand what the world will look like in two generations of more scarcity. So th there is a looming crisis out there. And maybe we don't have to deal with it, but I have two young kids now. Um, and they will certainly have to deal with it. Um, and so part of what I'm left to do at IndieBio, yes, yeah, the same. Every, every scientist, by the way, every, everyone in our field uses this graph. Because uh, I think it's from the New York Times, and we just block out the top. And, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so, so the point is biology is accelerating. And so that's, that's the whole point. Like, uh, it's accelerating faster than Moore's law. And in doing so, we're able to understand and contr control, manipulate the fundamental force of life, which is evolution. Um, and so biology is a technology, actually, unlike any other that we've had so far. It's a technology that can actually help with scarcity problems. Because we can do things around efficiency. We could do much more with fewer resources. And I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so what does this have to do with designers? Um, 
Well, design is a toolkit that scientists can use to go faster. And I think that's one of the biggest things that, that I've found um, in what I've been doing for the past couple years and in investing in, in uh, biotech startups. Um, and you can think about it, there's this wall between academia, which is discovery-based, right? And industry, which is application-based. And traditionally, you get the academia professors, and they pull out a discovery, and then there's a graduate student in their, in their lab, and they throw it over to them. They go, OK, go out into industry and make that happen. And then you get this degree of separation between the inventor of the technology and the implementer of that technology, and things don't really always work. So with design, you will, we could empower, and we are empowering, technical founders to build companies themselves. So they are not one degree separated or two degrees separated from the core technology, but actually able to build it on their own. Um, and so how do we actually design science to do so? Well, I pulled this out of Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> science is a process to understand nature at its base. That's from me. But this is the scientific method made a circle. Um, and it follows what we all know, right? Make an observation, think of a question, uh, create a hypothesis, build something to test the hypothesis, or do some research to test the hypothesis, and develop a theory, and then you know, recycle. Uh, it is a 10 to 20 year discovery cycle. It builds on the research of others, uh, and we are doing this for the understanding of the world around us. Design, I've been talking about design process and explaining it to clients for you know, a decade. And in the end, by the end of my sort of design-focused career, I started drawing it basically like this. You know, if you boil down all the circles, all the ways that it's ever been described, I see it as simply as uh, you learn something, you create something, and you keep doing that over and over again. Right? That's all it is. You, you could slap other things into it, but really you're just creating and learning. And so design and science are actually two sides of the same coin. They're doing the same thing. You just have different tool sets and sort of different goals, discovery versus application, but, but really you're doing the same thing. And so for me, again, I found a really nice, um, a really nice translator there uh, between what scientists are doing to build products and, and what designers are doing to build products. So there's certain things that scientists um, just don't have in their tool set that, they're, that they learn uh, in their PhDs and postdocs, which is talking to people, testing certain assumptions, super rapid iteration, uh, and understanding human friction. Because humans aren't necessarily always part of the problem or the equation in uh, scientific inquiry. So here's all the theory, right? All this, but how does it actually work in practice? So luckily, I've been able to build a, a laboratory for this uh, thinking called IndieBio. So it's a Early stage uh, seed accelerator, we fund um, companies for a quarter million dollars. Uh, we give them a full lab. They get four months to basically de-risk their business. Okay? Uh, if I said this, and well, actually, I said this to UCSF Gladstone Institute last week, and it's kind of mind-opening. What do you mean four months? Right? How, how do you do anything in four months? Well, I think the interesting thing is it's reframing what is possible and how you do it. Um, and so, like uh, it was introduced, we've funded a bunch of companies all over the map of, uh, of the biotech space. Um, and so, just for you guys tonight, I thought it'd be cool to extract four sort of principles of, of design for science. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples of, of what I'm talking about here. So, first is focus on the problem, not the solution. Seems pretty obvious, but it's not. Um, here's a good example. Everyone in the world is trying to make an artificial kidney right now. Every, there's, every scientist in regenerative medicine is trying to make an artificial kidney. It's an extremely big problem. Uh, right now, everyone is thinking about, well, this is a kidney, and this is the function of all the cells, so let's take cells and rebuild a kidney from scratch. Well, we found uh, Mortez, the CEO of, kid, of Kidney, and he was a material science guy, and he approached the problem very differently. Uh, he, saw it, he saw the problem actually as people that have kidney failure need to go to dialysis every day. If we can remove that need, then they have a free life, just like, they, just like everyone else. They may not have a kidney, but we just, they, they otherwise would be exactly the same. 
So he, uh, from a material science point of view, created a device that is implantable in the body that is, in essence, a tiny dialysis machine, right? So he reframed the problem for himself and had a vastly different solution than every other lab in the, in the world working on an artificial kidney. So what you see behind me right now is the first implantation of that device in a pig uh, demonstrating that it produced urea. Uh, that was done also within four months um, based on prior work. But it was, uh, it was a big milestone for the, for, for the company. So Geltor is another good example for understanding your customer. Again, for every designer in here, you're like, duh. Um, but it's, it's actually not so obvious all the time who your customer is, um, or what is the actual problem or friction that that customer is facing. Um, so Geltor is a company uh, that uh, has, they, they make collagen in bacteria, right? So collagen, normally you have to melt down horse noses and hooves and all the cartilaginous parts of animals. Uh, and that gives you jello and all the lovely things that we eat. Um, these guys can say, OK, well, we could take the collagen protein, right, and, uh, the piece of DNA that codes for that, as we learned in the last talk, thank you, um, and stick that into uh, E. coli bacteria and have it spit out tons and tons of collagen without ever having to harm an animal uh, or even grow one up and feed it and all of those things that you need to do for uh, uh, putting the cost into that. So they went out and they talked to their customers. And what they actually learned was, well, it's not the collagen per se that they needed to replace. They're like, well, you know, collagen's good and all, or gelatin's good and all, but it doesn't, like gel cap makers, I don't know if you know this, but all gel caps are made with animal gelatin. So if you're a vegetarian and you're eating gel caps, that's a problem. Turns out the world's biggest gel cap makers in India. And uh, they, they were the first ones to call Gelator going, hey, um, how soon can you get this to us? Um, <laughs> so uh, they are making, so what they're doing is they're actually able to take the, the sequence of the, of the protein and replace a few amino acids here and there, and that'll actually give you different functional properties of the collagen, so it's shinier, glossier for one application or have a lower melting point for another. So uh, by going out and talking to the bakers and all these people, they were able to diversify their product line off of seeming what seemed like one single product. Uh, another one is product is directed discovery. So this one um, is sort of another obvious one, but for scientists, it's like you're used to discovery. Why does it work? Why does it work? Why does it work? Well, sometimes you don't need necessarily to know why. You need to just make sure that it does work. Uh, so Strona is a company that we invested in that is uh, making a very rapid uh, test for foodborne pathogens, uh, taking what normally takes three, three days to culture to um, turn into three hours. Um, and so they, they're a great example of a team that fantastic science in the lab showing that it's working all the way down to one cell per cubic uh, you know, centimeter. And uh, we were like, well, where is it going to be used? Well, it's going to be used in a factory. Some dude is swabbing a, a side of a beef in a slaughterhouse, blood everywhere. Uh, and they're like, OK, well, what's the product? How is someone actually going to use it? So they went and went, oh, we need a swab. So that little red swab, this is a good example. Um, how does that actually work in terms of using the reagents and everything like that? So then they're like, they swab it. And they're like, oh, wow, the, the foam holds on to the bacteria. We can't, it doesn't let it go. So now they're doing all this research on different foams on swabs, right? And, and it, it, it goes to show you, right, the constraints. You have to find all your constraints. Your constraints aren't just the science in the laboratory. So a design approach uh, really helped them get to a product that was viable uh, much quicker on, a, on lower cost. And then finally, finding frictionless business models. None of this matters unless you can make money doing so. Um, otherwise, you're out of business. So here's a company called Mental Health. They're using artificial intelligence to match human clinical trial um, uh, for cancer immunotherapies and, and other therapies to patients' uh, medical records. So they're, able, they're using an AI and an LP, NLP to read all of the entire medical record and match it to a clinical trial, which is a very hard task. Um, turns out, right, who's going to pay for that? How, does that? how does that business actually work? And so one of the big things for them was talking to enough users and, and customers and, and everyone to understand 
what that business model in the end looks like. And so now they could provide the business for free and have pharma pay for the biomarkers that they are going to discover in getting all this uh, genomic and outcome data in one place, which is very hard to do. Those two things are normally separated by a wall, and through their service, they're able to bring it together. So uh, that turned a great company that, eh, you know, it's interesting, but, but a pass into, wow, okay, that, that can actually change the way we go about looking for data. So, you know, we've had a lot of great results um, in doing this experiment. I think the, the next experiment is to figure out how to scale what we're doing. And so over the next 20 uh, years, we're going to see fields blow up based on the advances of biology, right? So cellular agriculture is a big one. Uh, you know, Mem this is a shot of a company um, called Memphis Meats. Uh, they're, they're making animal muscle tissue uh, in vats without ever having to grow an animal. Uh, that's their actual chicken, um, deep fried southern chicken, <laughs> and, uh, and was just uh, tasted by the Wall Street Journal and had a big article about them yesterday. Um, gene augmentation, we were talking um, again about gene therapy. Uh, this will absolutely change and challenge a lot of the things we talk about every day. What does it mean not just to change genetic or, um, diseases that are hereditary, but choices I could make, like changing my you know, changing my eye color, things like that. We'll, as we understand the epigenetics and genetics of things, we'll be able to make those types of decisions. And then the question is, should we? Uh, N equals one healthcare. So I think that's, a, that's you know, like a snowflake, like you said, um, no two tumors are identical, no two diseases are identical, no two people are identical. So right now we do large scale clinical trials because we're looking for solutions that match most people. Right? And if you're an edge case, wow, that, that sucks. Um, in, in the long run, we're going to have, you aren't the edge case, you are the only case. But that, again, is going to require a redefinition of the FDA tr clinical trial process. Um, consciousness and machine UX, right? Like, uh, we're starting to, a big frontier is understanding consciousness. Uh, so this is a company um, called Koniku that we funded that's using human neurons uh, that are grown in a matrix and then grafted to a microchip to do compute, simple computation um, to uh, sensing of molecules. Uh, it flew a drone towards a TNT gradient um, as a demonstration. Um, and finally, you know, there's all this talk of going to Mars and, and the moon and all this kind of stuff. But the only way to actually do that, you're not going to fly an excavator to build this thing, right, to, to Mars. That's silly. So how are we going to actually do something like this? Well, it's going, to be hap it's going to have to happen through biology. So how do you mine the side of a mountain? Well, we're working on funding companies, and companies are being built around uh, bioremediation. So being able to put bacteria on a hillside that leach the metal ions out of that hill, and then you could collect it. So there's, there's got to be new ways of transporting our technologies and building them into life rather than necessarily taking hard, big pieces of machinery and things like that. Um, so the, the future is uh, rather interesting, as someone pointed out earlier. We live in interesting times. Um, that's true. And I think the next two generations are going are gonna to really be um, living in deeply interesting times. So thanks for listening. I, I, I went pretty fast, and I hope I uh, made it on time. Sorry. <laughs> that's great. Thank you.